More than $600,000 has been raised in honour of the late rugby league legend Paul Green to fund further research into CTE. Joining us live is Associate Professor Michael Buckland. He's the Executive Director of the Australian Sports Brain Bank and Head of Neuropathology at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Michael, really appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you so much. As I understand it, it was you who personally reached out to the NRL great Paul Green's family after his death. They donated his brain and that led to you being able to discover that he was suffering from stage 3 CTE. Just how much of a game changer has that been in terms of the way that this country has really begun to view head knocks? Oh, thanks, Ashley. Um, it, it was a really big uh, finding, I think, for Australia. I think also particularly for Queensland, where you know we'd already uh, talked about a couple of quite well-known AFL players that had uh, had passed away with CTE. But uh, I, in terms of rugby league states and particularly Queensland, I think Paul's diagnosis really got the message out there that. This was a disease that uh, was important and we had to take steps to make sure that we protect young players from, from uh, getting this disease in the future. Well, we have already seen the codes introduce stronger concussion policies, but in terms of a specific CTE minimisation policy, what would you see as best practice? What else needs to be done? Yes, well, concussion policies are, are very important to, to uh, minimise concussions and then to manage them properly. But yeah, that is it, it is slightly different to uh, a CTE policy. We know that uh, people that play contact sports such as rugby league and Australian rules football are exposed to quite significant forces that are uh, on their brain, um, usually multiple times in a game. Uh, and the vast majority of them don't uh, give us any signs or symptoms of a concussion. We just, we just keep going on. Uh, and it's those multitude of hits that we call sub-concussive hits, although some of them can actually be very powerful uh, forces. It's those multitude of hits over a period of time that determines your risk of CTE. So you are, you are at risk of getting CTE if you've had lots and lots of impacts, even if you've never had a concussion. So a CTE minimisation policy should be based on two fundamental principles. One is reducing your cumulative lifetime exposure to repetitive head impacts. And number two is delaying the age of first exposure to repetitive head impacts. Michael, I know this weekend I'll be out there on the, the pitch. It's the first round of the winter sports season for, for a lot of kids' sports this weekend. Do you think it's safe for our kids to be playing footy and rugby in particular? And I'm talking about smaller children here. Do we need to have a rethink about the contact elements of the sports that our children are playing? I think we do. Uh, I think that uh, now is the time to revisit this issue. It's great. I mean, it's great to see kids out on the footy field, uh, kicking and running. All those things are really good, particularly in a team context. We just don't want them to get hit in the head a lot. Uh, it sounds pretty simple when you put it like that. And I think if, if you had a child and you saw them fall off a bike and whack their head, you would be really concerned. But it's, it's remarkable that uh, all these parents go and watch their children every weekend, often sustaining blows to their head, and that's got to stop. So I would like to see uh, low or no contact versions of these games in um, the children, at least until they reach high school. And could helmets help with that if we arm our kids with those every weekend? Helmets are good at, at uh, stopping uh, soft tissue injuries, so injuries to the scalp as well as the underlying skull. Uh, they may have a little bit of effect on uh, the impacts to the head and the, the brain, the potential brain injury underlying those, but they don't really seem to make much of a difference. We know that the worst sort of forces applied to the brain are acceleration, deceleration forces and rotational forces. So uh, you really even don't have to be hit in the head. You can have a whiplash type event 
which will also give you a mild traumatic brain injury. So helmets aren't the answer. Just finally, Michael, for people who are listening to this interview, they might not have been professional sports people or um, you know, feel like they've sustained lots of, of knocks to the head. But if they are remembering instances over their lifetime where they did get a, a hard knock on the sporting field or, or had an accident of some sort, what are the symptoms they should be looking out for? At what point do you need to go and speak to someone about this? How is it actually diagnosed? Yes, that's a good question, Ashley. Um, I think one of the downsides of talking about CTE is that lots and lots and lots of people have played contact sports and it, it can generate some anxiety um, for people now thinking back about, oh, you know, what have I done? We know that even in the professional uh, arena where these people are exposed to, to very large numbers over many years, um, that their risk of CTE is still, we don't know what it is, but it's not like everyone gets it. So if you've been a keen amateur, um, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, I think if you have, you're worried about things like uh, depression or anxiety or forgetfulness, I mean, it's always good to go and see a doctor and get that assessed uh, because most of those symptoms are treatable. Uh, so we want to get the message that this is an important issue that's going to affect some people but we don't want to alarm lots of people that, you know, they've got this terrible disease. Michael, Michael Buckland, look, really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us and, and speaking to us about that today. Just part of the uh, increasing awareness that we're having about CTE. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Ashley.